Hey everybody, Matt Colville here. We played D&D last week and we're gonna play tonight in just a few hours. Uh, last week's session was pretty remarkable actually. I, I had a blast. I just had a lot of fun and I feel like it was sort of the ideal D&D scenario from my point of view in that it was, you know, half a session's worth of really cool role playing and then half a session's worth of fun combat. This is the campaign diary where I just explain what, what happened. I sort of narrate it as a story and I embed my commentary in it as we go so that if there's anything to be learned from last week's session, we covered here. Just for some context, at six o'clock on Wednesday nights, my friends start showing up and that's basically pencils down for me. There might still be, I have to print some stuff out or get some miniatures ready, but at that point we are getting ready for the show. And at three o'clock last Wednesday, uh, three hours to showtime, I had nothing ready. I had prepared nothing. And I told the players, I said, hey, I don't know if we're going to be able to play tonight. Maybe we punt till next week. Maybe we play another night this week. And they they sort of freaked out. They were like, oh, we can't we can't not play. Uh, it's the stream. It's a it's a product. You, you, you told people we were going to be playing. Oh, and some of them, you know, some of them were just disappointed. Oh, God, I really want to play tonight. And I was like, OK. So what I had planned on doing, and this was probably going to take, it might have taken a couple of weeks of prep, was getting all the downtime activity the players want. Do they want to split up, go lots of different places, investigate stuff, get magic items made? They discovered, because I told them, that it's going to take them the better part of a year to make one of these magic items. So either we need to bend the rules there a little bit. This is according to the rules. There are a couple of different rule sets, depending on what rule book you're looking in for 5th edition. But they all, there's no way to get, you know, a rare item, a really powerful item made made quickly because then they're, they'd be all over the place and magic items are rare. So I was going to have all, I wanted to work on all this different stuff for the players to do. They want to go to the academy and give the lecture they've been invited to give. They have tickets to the opera. Judge wants to go to the tiefling ghetto. And all of these are going to turn into little mini uh, adventures, if not adventures, they, uh, encounters, maybe just role-playing encounters. But cool stuff should happen. And I had none of that ready. And it was really daunting. And I, so I said, screw it. And I threw all that out and I basically started prepping the next adventure and that's what you saw. There's a link in the doobly doo. I don't remember how long we played for. I think it was a while. I think we went to a little bit. I think we went for the three and a half hour mark, which is pretty typical for us. I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to do the downtime stuff, but that was going to take a ridiculous amount of prep time. And once, so that's, th there's this thing about the way things should go. I know how things should go. I know the right way to do this, the ideal way to do this, the proper way to do this. But once, once I got over that, once I was like, wait, you know, as long as the players have fun, they're not going to know that I cut all this. And they're not going to care as long as they're experiencing cool stuff. So I have to get over myself. I have to get over my own expectations for what needs to happen next. And I knew as far as the chain of Acheron goes, what the group was going to do next, they're going to meet Lady Shirome, the head of the Fulcrum, one of the seven great powers in the city. And they're going to start encountering the next adventure. So at three o'clock, I started writing about the heroes going to meet Lady Shirome. And once I started to do that, you know, everything started flowing and I suddenly felt a lot better. And by 3.30, I knew I was going to make it. I knew I was going to be fine. And it was a lot of fun. I, I didn't know anything about the Fulcrum or their headquarters, really, until I started writing it and discovering it. So the heroes, because of what happened last week, Lady Antonia, the head of Red Falcons, wants to meet Lady Shirome because she knows a lot about the head of 12 Dragons. She knows that he's a wang, but she doesn't really know the folks who run the Fulcrum and she needs to. And the players are saying, we work for her. Well, they don't really. They work for the Royal Heraldric Society. They've just discovered that the Royal Heraldric Society is like nested inside the Fulcrum. So they've gone to the right honorable Persevent Thilwith, who is a half-elf bard herald and very uh, very ill at ease, easily agitated, uh, never quite sure of himself, a, a very minor person who doesn't normally interact with the outside world. He normally spends all his time in libraries doing research and having to deal with folks like the Chain of Akron kind of freaks him out. Having to deal with Lady Shromi kind of freaks him out, but he agrees that the chain say, hey, we found the document we want, but before we give it to you, we want to talk to your master. We want to talk to Lady Shromi. And he hesitantly says, oh, I, 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 I'm, sure she'll, I'm sure she'll see us. I describe to the players where on the stays, the Manhattan-sized island that is part of capital Lady Shirome, the Fulcrum's headquarters are. It's in the Basilica of St. Bonagrazia. St. Bonagrazia is the Riohan saint of luck and gambling. And this is an old, ancient, Kalian, uh, civic 
building that looks sort of like a church because St. Bonagrazia is the saint of luck and gambling. When the players arrive on the ground floor, it's this large open area. It's basically a gambling den, but it's not, gambling's not illegal in this city. And this is a church of the saint of gambling. And there are stained glass windows all around the wall that show the life of St. Bonagrazia and how he was chosen to be a saint and why he's the saint of luck and gambling. And there are even these friars, they're, they're priests of St. Bonagrazia around the walls at small tables doing consultations one-on-one, -on -one, sort of like hearing confession, except St. Bonagrazia's version, which is not, first of all, it's not private. It's not in a little booth. It's just a small table, one-on-one, -on -one, with the Fool's Deck, which is the Capitals version of the Tarot Deck. And the players don't know this, but the Fool's Deck is all of the uh, the nobles in the gods and saints of Rioja, because they're like a big court. They, they're a family. They're all related to each other, and they sort of reflect the mortal courts of places like Capital. That's just the ground floor. So Ithilwith leads them up to the second floor, which is where the business of the fulcrum is conducted. Lots of desks, I imagine it looking like an 18, a 19th century bank, like a Victorian bank. Lots of folks at desks doing math and figures and passing uh, notes and documents to runners who are taking them back and forth. And there are people reporting in. Somebody comes in with a, a spyglass, a telescope, and reports that a certain ship from Higara is going to be in port in just an hour. They've already seen it. And suddenly there's a flurry of activity. There's a a big board. This, by the way, is a reference to Galileo. This is one of the ways that Galileo got himself in trouble was he used the telescope. He sold his new telescope to all these merchants because they could look, they could use the spyglass to see when ships were coming into port way before anyone else could see. And they knew, ah, this shipment's going to be here. So they could invest in it knowing it was coming when no one else knew. That's what the fulcrum does. They have a huge board that shows a map of Orden. It shows a map of the world. It's got all the trade routes mapped out. And it even has on each trade route, it's got uh, red and black arrows going up or down that judge things like the weather and piracy and stuff like that so they can they can judge how likely is a ship going to be late or early how likely is it to, to get to not make it each of the regions of Rioja have little symbols for what uh, goods are traded there and prices that they have they write on magnets they can stick up there it's like a giant essentially a huge whiteboard except it's got a map of Orden on it and there's this large Vanagarian woman who is Shomi's bodyguard who's kind of running the whole place Phil says oh so this is like the stock exchange. And I was like, well, no, not exactly. They actually have a stock exchange on the stays and it's controlled by the fulcrum, but it's a whole other building in another part of town. This is more like the Fed. This is where monetary policy is set. Though I recognize that the difference is kind of blurred here. It filled with leads them to Shirome's office, which has two guards in front of it and the guards and all the guards in this building all have the same outfits on. They have uh, their, their gold and red and they have the symbol of a hammer striking a coin and they're called the Knights of the Stamp. But nobody, nobody really refers to them that way. Everybody calls them the hammers. Ithilwith promises, he's so flustered, Ithilwith promises the players that Shirome will, uh, on his on his word, that she will see them. He is led into the room. They're, they're held to wait for just like 90 seconds. They're introduced to Lady Shirome. Ithilwith refers to her as your grace. She's a duke or a duchess. They don't get really hung up on the gendered terms in Rioja. And the players are like, oh, I don't think they realize that she's not just the head of this faction. She's also a nobleman. I think some of the players knew that. Some of the players didn't know that. Uh, you know, Shirome bought her way. Not only did she buy her way into the nobility. She paid for two of the other guilds to do it too, or kind of loaned them the money that they needed. And her office is what you would expect from sort of a, a Victorian banker's office. Huge oak desk, a lot of references, on, like a library on the walls, and huge windows looking out on the city. It's one of the taller buildings in this part of the city, so you can see all the territory that Lady Shirome governs. She's not only the head of the fulcrum, the fulcrum run this island. They are the government here. That's true of each of the seven factions. The colored territory territory on the map of capital is their city. It's like their country. In fact, I think the players are going to meet somebody next session who refers to capital as it's not one city. It's like seven cities. It's at least seven cities. Nothing in capital. This would be a good line. I need to remember this. Nothing that happens in capital makes sense until you realize that capital is seven different nations, each waiting to see who's going to come out ahead in the big war that's coming. Lady Shirome and her knights, or Deodata, are having a conversation. Lady Shirome says, whose side is he on? And her knight says, well, his own probably. And she says, but he stopped Alvaro from taking the pellet. And her knight goes, did he? Right, asking a leading question, and they're talking about the head, even though this isn't explicit. I think the players picked up on this. They're talking about the head of House Verona. House Verona are the ones who delivered the advancers to the pellet so they could stop, they could kind of block 
House Alvaro's attempt to take that island. And this is not in accord. This action is not entirely in accord with everything Lady Sharmi knows, as the players are about to find out. We then had about... I don't know. I, it seemed like it might have been like 90 minutes, but in reality, it might only these things always my sense of time gets get screwed up when I'm deep in the role playing nonsense. And it might only have been 20 minutes, it might have been 45 minutes. We had a long extended period of just role playing Lady Shirome and Sir Deodato talking to the heroes. One of the first things that happens is Sir Deodato gets up and claps King, the commander of the chain on the shoulder and says, well done, well done. He says, damn 12 dragons, may Valerius de Crono be covered in 10,000 infected wounds. So immediately the players like this guy. <laughs> Lady Shirome asks if they want tea, and she has a whole set uh, put out for them on a small table, and she points out that there's something here for all of them. There's star water from the Astral Sea for the Gith. There's uh, wine. There's drow wine here. There's Ryohan wine here. There's there's Higaran tea, and the Higaran tea cup for a king has the gold uh, leaf around the edge, which is only for nobles. There's wine from Alloy, which is where it judges from. There's Goblin Swill, which Copper then spends the rest of the session with his head buried in the swill, drinking and going, ah! blah, 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 blah. which was perfect because Tom is not someone who's going to do a lot of in-character role-playing, but it's always great to know what Copper is doing, and that visual was perfect. So this is a huge power play on the part of Lady Shromane. It wasn't clear to me that the players got it in the moment, but we went to lunch the next day, our D&D lunch, and then talking to them, it was perfectly clear that they got it. This was Lady Shirome telling the players, look what I know. Look what I can find out. I can find out everything. I know that King is a, a low-functioning Higaran noble, or was, before he jo joined the chain. And not only what do I know, but what I can get. I can get anything I need. I run all the trade in and out of the greatest fantasy city in this or any age. Capital is bigger than Alloy, which is kind of my universe's version of Sigil. Also, my universe's version of the City of Brass. It's kind of the hub of the multiverse. Capital has more trade even than an interdimensional trading city. So there was a lot of role playing. I can't redo it all, but basically Lady Shiromi wants to understand who the chain are and what they want. She knows about about their contract and they seem to now be a little bit more pro Lady Shiromi now that they've learned that the guy they used to like, uh, Lord Alvaro, because of what they read about him and what people said, his knights are awful. They they hate them. So they're looking for somebody to work with and, and Lady Shiromi's message is basically you carry the prince's seal now, which she says is a, I don't know how you pulled that off, frankly. That's something that really surprises her. But if I were you, she goes, you know, you haven't asked for my advice, even though many people do. But if I were you, I would do everything I could to stay neutral. The players are really interested in finding out, is Shirome pro-Ajax or anti-Ajax? And I, I think we got a certain way toward Lady Shirome explaining that, that that language doesn't make any sense to her and probably wouldn't make sense to any of the Lords of Capital, even when you hear people saying like like Alvaro speaking out against Ajax he's just trying to get the trying to get the nobles to feel a sense of urgency lady show me explains that all of the different heads of the factions want to be the winner in this coming war and the first thing they're going to do once the war is over is probably start preparing for war with Ajax so her attitude is the sooner we get this over with the better but she doesn't want to be under House Alvaro's thumb any more than she wants to be under Ajax's thumb. She looks out the window at one point and she talks about everything we've achieved. She means I, everything I've achieved. She came here with nothing and she has built this empire. She's scrabbled her way up in the most competitive political environment imaginable. And she looks out at the sea. I don't think the players recognize this. I think they thought this was another power play, but it wasn't. This was her having a moment of humanity where she's like, these are my people now. I run this this city, this is my nation, and I'm gonna do what I have to do to protect these people. I don't want them to end up under some other you know, nobleman's thumb. I don't wanna end up the smallest province in Alvaro's empire, or Ajax's. So when the players ask stuff, when they try to wheedle out from her kind of answers that would make their lives easier but don't reflect how she thinks, at one point I think they just ask her whose side she's on or who she would want to win if it wasn't her. Again, this is this is the players I think sometimes trying to find a way not to play D and D. Right? There's this. Uh, they're they're aware of the idea of the law of unintended consequences, and they're hoping that if they ask the right question or make the right skill roll, that they can avoid ever having any unintended consequences. But that's never on the table, right? So they're trying to find a way to to figure out who are we supposed to work for, what are we supposed to do? Is there some way to take this thorny situation and make it simpler so that we don't have to make hard decisions? And Lady Shirome just says. 
I liked the prince. And she doesn't explain what she means by this, and the players don't really ask, but she means she liked it when there was some other entity, hereditary leader in charge, that wasn't really interested in any of these seven factions, and so was treating them all equally. I mean, he was incredibly egalitarian. He allowed these you know, peasants, basically, who were merchants and rich, they weren't nobles, to buy their way into the nobility, which all the other nobles hated. And that's the last time Shirome can remember not being worried about who was in charge, not having to worry about fighting for control over the city that she now runs or any of that stuff. When the prince was in charge, things were fine. And now that that time is gone. It's never going to come back. At one point, she referred to the Lord of House Alvaro by his first name. She referred to him as Prospero and then caught herself and said Duke Alvaro. And the players all picked up on that. Everybody in chat picked up on that. And they were like, oh, is, there, is there some kind of relationship between these two characters? But really, what I was trying to express, and who knows, maybe, but what I was trying to express was the fact that Lady Shirome, unlike the players, and like most of the people in Capital, Lady Shirome has dealt with all of these noble lords, all of these dukes. She has dealt with, in some cases, on a daily basis. She's gone to the Privy Council and met there and argued with them and been shouted at by them. And she sees them as equals, as peers, and she refers to them as peers. But that is not the done thing here in a meeting like this with a bunch of mercenaries. So she catches herself and refers to him by his formal title. But it didn't mean anything other than I don't see him as as anything other than this other guy I have to deal with. Uh, which is certainly, you know, probably more than he sees her. She asks the heroes about their relationship with House Verona, the Navy. She's aware that they're the beneficiaries of this implied relationship between the chain of Acheron and House Verona. And she's also, she suspects that it's entirely one way, that it's just a Verona, the Lord of House Verona making a power play, using politics, and the chain of Acheron are just the pawns that he's, that he's using. And she asks them, would they be willing to help kind of evict the church's troops, this house Navarre, a whole other house, the church's troops from the Citadel. And they're like, well, we don't know that we want to make an enemy out of the church. And then uh, Deodato says, well, don't worry, we can take care of that. We can give you a thin veneer of, we can make sure that you're wearing our livery so that you'd be fighting for us, but people, there'd be plausible deniability, which the players like. They're like, oh, actually, that sounds good enough. You know, that's there's as long as there's um, a thin political veneer of of explainability over the top of this, then we're probably okay with that. And he explains that House, while House Verona, I don't think the players knew this, while House Verona has been helping you, they've been screwing us. He let your scouts, in fact, he escorted your scouts intercepting them. They wanted to go to the stays and he dropped them off on the pellet on purpose with their weapons and told them to go to a library. Meanwhile, he is sort of blockading anyone who wants to try to get their troops onto the Citadel and allowing the church to reinforce itself. And so this is one of those situations where, again, this is what the conversation at the beginning of the meeting was when Sir Deodato's like, I think he's on his side. I don't think he's on our side. I don't think he's on Alvaro's side. He tried to stop Alvaro from taking the pellet, and the chain are just pawns that he's using. So what if what if we use the chain as pawns? And the chain were like, that's not a ridiculous suggestion. We might be interested in doing that, but it would cost a lot of money, and we want to deal with you. We don't want to deal with this with this herald. And and it's not clear to even me that Lady Shromi knew that Ithilwith was going to hire the chain. That might have just been something he did, but that who who was the, actually responsible for hiring them is probably something that I'm I'm never going to drill down too closely on. She asks them if they'd be interested in meeting their benefactor, the Lord of House Verona. Have you met Duke Marco Verona? She asks, and they're like, no, we've only met uh, the his one of his lieutenants, the Admiral Damasco. She very quickly dashes off a letter, probably only a couple of lines long, the players don't see what she wrote, to Duke Marco Verona, seals it with her seal in wax, hands it to them and says that so far, uh, Duke Marco has enjoyed keeping you guys at arm's length and using you kind of as pawns, but if you take this letter to his manor house, then he will see you and then you'll get to have a face-to-face -face with one of the other uh, heads of of the noble families here in the city. And there's no there's no real urgency to this, but the players are like, yeah, we want to meet this guy. That made me happy because there was no clear reason why Shromi doesn't seem to get anything out of this exchange other than sort of empowering the chain a little bit, which is maybe does get her something. And the players didn't ask what's in it for us or anything like that. They were just like, yeah, we want to meet that guy. And that means to me they're taking the game seriously and they're taking these NPCs seriously and having FaceTime with the different rulers of the seven factions is valuable to them, which is great because I needed them to get out of the stays in order for the next adventure to start.
part because the next adventure does not happen in the stays. And so they were what they they wrap up their meeting with Lady Shirome. They take their note and they begin. They they leave for the first time, I guess, since they went and saw Sumat Pole. They go into the city and they've now got the prince's seals, so they are able to show the seals and get through the city gates, no problem. And they have to, in order to get to Duke Marco's territory, the blue territory on the map of capital, they have to go through some more of the prince's neutral territory in the city proper. And this is where stuff, this is where the other half of Dungeon, we've done the blah blah, and now it's time for the rock'em sock'em. And I bought, I, I have these tiles, I have no idea where I got them. I literally probably have them. Got 20 years ago you can see them on the stream they're just uh dun they're like dungeon tiles but they're city tiles and they're really pretty they look even better on camera like what well, we noticed watching watching our video of it i'm like wow that that these tiles look amazing on screen and i think they were for some war game that i, I never bought i think it was a french game i don't remember and it's a really nice kind of what you would expect to see from a, a venice style city i think I grabbed a couple of these tiles, I laid them out, and I said, all right, you folks are on your way. I describe how this part of the city is much older. The streets are very windy and twisty and turny. The houses are two or three stories and sometimes built up out over the streets so that people can open their windows and, you know, trade uh, items and stuff like that. And there, But there are city squares and stuff. And as they're walking through the city, and the map I had on the table, the dungeon house had, you know, branching different parts of the streets, which was really neat, and, and it showed the roofs and stuff like that. So if the players wanted to jump up on the roof and have a chase across the rooftops, we could have done it. And I described how in this pressing crowd of people, they see, uh, they hear a scream, and they are, then they hear lots of screaming, and they see as the crowd parts and people run past them, they see down this one alleyway a a dragonborn, like a, a, a dragon man, uh, in pain and agony, dropping to his knees. He's screaming, and then his bones start to snap. His flesh starts to tear and fly apart, and then reconstitute itself in a much, much larger form. And when this transformation is complete, I grabbed my mini and said, there is a black dragon in this alleyway. The players are like, is that how big it is? I was like, that is how big it is. It is a huge, uh, I don't think it's ancient, but it's one step down from ancient. It's an adult black dragon. And the copper is like, okay, well, that's weird. Let's keep going, which I love. I love that idea that the Chain of Akron aren't the good guys, and they could if they, he's joking, but he doesn't have to be joking. If the Chain of Akron wanted to be like, well, see ya. I think that would be really cool, actually. And don't it, I would have all sorts of other ways to hook them in. This one encounter wasn't the only way to do it. But the player's like, we got to do something about this. And a couple of the players, I think Leech and Copper, have an get initiative before the Black Dragon. The Black Dragon is obviously angry, like insane, basically, lashing out, and they try to zap this black dragon and then retreat. But then it was the black dragon's turn. The black dragon used its 80 feet of movement and flew over the city block and landed behind them. So the place they had retreated to was now the front lines. And then the dragon breathed the line of fire doing 56 damage. Which was, uh, that would have been enough. I think it might have dropped Copper or maybe, yeah, dropped Copper and then Leech used his ability to immediately bring him back up again. Slim, who's kind of the toughest, nastiest character in the group, was actually a little worried. I think he had 20-something hit points left after that. The players now realize this is serious. We have to try to kill this thing. They're casting spells at it. King casts a spell. I have to make a saving throw. I make the saving throw in front of him. I roll a one. And then I look at King and I say, he saves. And Lars is like, what? Man, that's... And then he used an expletive. And I was like, legendary resistances, there's three times a day you can just decide to save. And that was another thing I told the players on purpose. Remember the video about information, the flow of information, how important it is. Me doing that told, gave the players some indication of how powerful this thing was. It has legendary actions. It has legendary resistances. If I only narrated it, they would be sitting there trying to figure out what, does his bonus just so high that he can roll? What's, what's going on here? Is Matt just being, what, what, what's going But I said, nope, here's the mechanic behind it. And they went, oh, now they understand what they're dealing with. And then Anna did something completely remarkable and blew my mind. People watching because of my reaction, they thought I had to improvise an answer. And I was kind of trying to save the players from this uh, the overwhelmingly powerful dragon that is not true this is in my notes is that if any of the players cast dispel magic on the dragon the effect goes away and it reverts back to being a dragonborn and i actually had anna because i didn't want to make it seem that cut and dry i allowed anna to continue the process of casting the spell which includes a die roll and then i said okay yeah i closed the monster manual and i said it goes back to being a dragonborn and people in chat were like oh, you know matt's taking it easy on him and i was like no this is actually how you solve this this is in my notes and the dragonborn's 
naked and they're like they're, they go up to him and Boots is like, uh, "Does this happen to you often? You know, were, were you were you bitten by a radioactive dragon?" I think is what one of the players asked. And the Dragonborn's just kind of out of it; has no idea what just happened. It's like I've got to get to the a church. I think is what he says, which is his way of saying a hospital. After I put the black dragon down, we took a break, and as we were leaving the room, I pulled Tom uh, playing copper aside and said, "You notice a, a tall, like ten foot tall, robed man that is moving purposefully away from the site of the of the dragon transformation and pushing people out of his way." And and Tom's like, "Can I can I follow him?" And I said, "Well, he he goes. Or the last thing he sees, he goes around a corner. But you know which corner he went around there." Okay. So when we got back together, Tom explained to the players what he had seen and. And King's like, can you track him? And Tom's like, yeah, I can probably follow him. I'm, I'm Copper. I'm the best ranger. Now the battle is over and they're like, Copper, where was that tall robed figure? Let's go find him. Now Copper and Boots, because Copper's on a displacer beast and Boots has the Mooncat's boots, which give him an extra 10 feet of movement. So now they both have 40 feet of movement, are able to follow this robed figure through the city. And the next thing they see is, uh, they hear, in fact, the players can all hear this screaming and howling and wailing. And when Copper and Boots round the corner, there's a whole city square where they watch the people who were in the square. This process is almost over. The people who are remaining in the city square are screaming and reaching out, asking for help, trying to get away from what's happening as their bodies dissolve into this huge, it's like 60 feet wide and 80 feet long, red russet mold that covers the entire square and starts climbing up the buildings. They see this robed figure running away. I have to make perception checks and I think it was boots or copper sees this glint of metal when the cloak that this figure is wearing billows aside and it was like silver or gold. It was some very bright, uh, shiny metal and they're like, what is going on? And they're immediately, they realize that whatever this is, there's going to be more random crazy stuff like this. If we don't stop that figure, we got to go find him. So they resolve to essentially ignore the russet mold and try to stop that figure, which is easier for some of the players than others because some of them can, can get up on the roof easily like copper or they can leap and jump or they have spells like King casts haste on Slim at this point, which is going to become, I think, their standard operating procedure because Slim hasted even without using, which he often doesn't do. He often doesn't use the psionic crystal he has, which gives him an extra I think 3d8 on all of his melee attacks because it takes an action and he can do so much damage in one round spending one round doing nothing is a huge time sink for him the russet mold is not that big a deal it is uh, it has pseudopods it attacks people it's going to start consuming the city and when it hits you you have to make a saving throw otherwise your constitution goes down until I think um, restoration or cure disease or something is cast on you and it's going to keep getting worse and you get cut you could get turned into a russet mold but the players are going to make their saving throws between their spells and guidance and stuff like that. So that's not a big deal, but it did have an impact. A couple of the players got hit by the Russet Mold and their hit points go down because their constitution goes down by two. That means your con bonus goes down by one and that means one hit point per level is now gone. So that happened a couple of times, but otherwise the Russet Mold was just an obstacle. This is an encounter, by the way, that I largely improvised. I knew on paper that it was going to be, uh, I didn't know how big it was. I hadn't drawn out a tactical map or anything like that. I just knew they're going to fight a big Russet Mold. I didn't think they were going to be able to really stop this figure at this point. But the chain of Akron, when they put their minds, to, this is probably true of your group as well. When they put their minds to thing to something, the extraordinary stuff can be done. Boots is the first person because of the Mooncat's boots to get into melee with this robe figure. And he grabs uh, the robe and tries to pull it off him. And the figure turns and touches Boots. And Boots has to make a saving throw and he fails. And he transforms into a shambling mound. I literally give Tom the Shambling Mound monster card and said, this is who you are now. Your int is three. You do not remember being Boots. And that was basically Tom out of the rest of the combat. King at one point tried to get close to this figure later in the combat. And just getting within 30 feet of this figure causes your spells to start firing wildly and randomly at various targets. Slim takes his turn and it's 19 minutes thanks to MCDM stats, who I actually have no idea who MCDM stats is or are. 
are, but they have a Twitter feed you can follow. I'll try to remember to put a link in the doobly-doo, and they do a phenomenal job tracking all of the metrics of the game. And I actually said, I asked them, the most useful thing to me is not how many die rolls everybody made and what their averages were. The most useful thing to me is how long were the combats, how many actions were taken, how long was each person's turn. And so now they're tracking that. And the average turn was three minutes and 50 seconds. It's normally closer to three minutes. But the outlier was Slim's turn in this combat with the russet mold and the robed figure because Slim took 19 minutes. It didn't, it didn't seem like 19 minutes. It was actually 19 minutes. And Phil did not like that. Phil felt really bad afterwards, but I didn't feel bad because he did a remarkable number of things on his turn. He has to hasted, he has to cast jump so that he can get to this figure, and then I had to give him the bad news, which is that jump doesn't give you extra movement. It just lets you use more of your 30 feet of movement. I think he gets a bonus from haste. It lets you use more of that to jump over things. Phil didn't like that. He wanted to be able to basically run his movement and then jump a whole bunch. He wanted some free movement. But I do think that I'm gonna probably look at the jump spell and let it give you some extra movement because I think that is more in accord with what the player casting it would expect. I don't think it was gonna change the combat or the game that much. Slim has to do a bunch of crazy stuff just to get into melee with this creature. But once he does, uh, it, th it's going to die. And I, I told him that at one point. I said, just so you folks know, you can kill this thing. How do they know that? They don't. The purely meta information from me, but I felt it was super important for the players to have that information. Otherwise, they might think this thing is unkillable because Boots, this is before he got turned into a shambling mound, Boots and uh, and Slim are, are flanking this creature and finally they're able to get its robes off of it and it reveals itself as a solar celestial, which is a, a, a true elf is how I described it, a sun elf. Now, this is something that some of my players know about. This is unique to my world. The elves that you meet in the world, the ones described in the player's handbook, are the lesser elves. They were created by the true elves to be servants. The wood elves are like the garden tenders, and the high elves are like the archivists and librarians, and they were made to serve these true elves, and they're 10 to 12 feet tall. And Phil says, wait, didn't we meet one of these in the last campaign as Graves? My old character, didn't we meet a star elf? And I'm like, yep, this is the same thing. That was a star elf. This is a sun elf, also known as a solar celestial. Not the same thing as the solar or planetar or deva in the monster manual, those are angels. Uh, but I use the stats for our planetar, and really the only thing I did, this thing's CR 16, the only thing I did that wasn't, I think, strictly according to Hoyle, was when this creature had a chance to use its melee attacks, which would have probably killed at least one player, I instead had him use a spell. The idea being, it's mad, this creature is mad. It's a good guy. The players are like, wait, aren't the, aren't the sun elves supposed to be good? Uh, well, sort of, uh, you know, depending on your point of view. They're mostly alien, but yes. So they started to realize this thing's probably not, it's speaking, it's shouting at them, but they don't understand its language. And they were really frustrated because they wanted to understand what he was saying. And like, don't these things speak every language? And I, I didn't say this, but the answer is, of course, yes, they do. But that doesn't mean they're going to say that this creature is obviously under a lot of stress, however that stress is manifested. And it's just using its native language. It's not trying to communicate that to them, really. Then the solar celestial turns boots into a shambling mound. Copper uses translator, which is one of his five special arrows. He shoots an arrow at a wall. He's really far away from this thing. He shoots an arrow at a wall. And he doesn't have a line of sight. He shoots translator at a wall uh, next to the alleyway that this uh, battle is happening on. And as soon as it hits the wall, as soon as the arrow hits the wall, he immediately teleports to where the arrow is and uses uh, part of his interacting with an object to grab the arrow out of the wall. And now uh, copper's in range and a line of sight of this creature so the amount of damage per round is going up. And they are able to kill this thing. Every time they wound it, it bleeds silver blood. As it's getting closer to death, its wounds all start glowing, this brilliant white light. And when they finally deliver the killing blow, it was probably slim, it might have been copper. When they finally deliver the killing blow, all of its wounds just rip open and the light, the blinding white light inside it erupts out, literally blinding everybody in line of sight of this thing. That, blind, that blindness only lasts for a minute or two. Combat's basically over at this point. I explained to the players that they'll be able to take care of the russet mold. The, the, the word 
which are the knights, the princess knights on this part of the city. There are the city guard, just like the Red Falcons. These are both the guards and the folks who run the city. They're the cops. They're the city guard. They're the cops. They're the militia. They show up and they'll be able to work with the players. You're going to meet them in the next session. And that was basically the end. The last thing, the solar celestial, the sun elf, that was the name of the episode, by the way, the lat, which was funny because the players often have no idea what the name of the episode is that they are in the middle of playing. And often the there's clues to what's going to happen in the title of the episode. But Matt O'Driscoll got an alert on his phone and he saw the sun elf didn't mean anything to him. So this whole process was fun to watch him realize oh, this is the sun elf that is the title of the episode before it dies it puts its hand on slim and it communicates telepathically to slim it says the forbiddances fail the seals are broken the emperor must be told and then it dies and slim's like what does that mean and the players actually I don't, I, I, they still don't know really. They know that something, something bad is happening. I don't know that they're aware of how out of time the experience they just had was. Um, cause there are no, there are with, you know, yeah, there are, I think from their point of view, there are no celestials left in the more, in the mundane world. The astral celestials, the, the true dark elves, they were banished to the world below and all the other true elves, the sun elves, the sky elves, uh, the sylvan elves all went to live with their god in Arcadia, their god Val. So you don't see these guys around anymore, but they used to be around. They used to be pretty common. So what is going on? I think Anna or someone else might have said this has something to do with the wards of the last emperor that Matt is combining a couple of different campaigns that he pitched to us because this sounds like when he says forbiddances and seals, didn't the last emperor seal up all his knowledge, which is by the way, something I stole from the Chronicles of Thomas Covenant, one of my favorite fantasy series is growing up. True, correct. Anna is Anna. Whoever thought that is right. This does have something to do with the Wars of the Last Emperor. And I think the players started talking about, certainly people in chat were like, oh, it's Ringwell. Yes, correct. It is a mega dungeon that I am going to be running. Ringwell is a lost dungeon that no one knows where. It's kind of like the foundation from Isaac Asimov's foundation. Everybody knows it exists, but no one knows where he put it. And people are like, well, he couldn't, he wouldn't put it in capital. That's stupid. And then other people are like, well, he must've put it in capital because it isn't anywhere else. Uh, capital was his, the last emperor's capital city. It was the, it was the capital city of the Kalian empire. So yeah, this is the beginning of the players and uh, getting, this, this is the beginning of the players sort of leaving the politics behind. They're never really truly ever going to leave the politics behind because the, the, the appearance of the Ringwell dungeon in capital is going to be just, you know, it's going to cause all sorts of conflicts between all the great houses, but it's also going to, uh, the, the, the war against Ajax is going to get properly started. I believe now, and the players are going to meet people who don't want the next session Spoilers, the players are going to meet one of the lords of capital, not one of the nobles that run the city, one of the truly powerful beings in the city that don't really care about their they're way above politics. They're going to meet one of them next week, and I believe that is going to I, – I, I sort of don't – I don't know how much I want this to happen. So a little bit of a spoiler here. The players are going to meet one of the lords of capital – who is firmly anti-Ajax and has the power to do something about it, especially if Ringwell has been found. And the players are going to be this character's agent. And it's suddenly a lot of ambiguity for the players is going to resolve because they're going to meet somebody who is unambiguously good and unambiguously opposed to Ajax and clearly able to do something about it and wants to use the PC. So they're immediately going to be like, oh, thank God. But... Part of the fun of the game so far has been the fact that there are no easy answers in Capital. Or at least they haven't been until now. And the players have done extraordinary things. The, the king raising Lady Antonia and her and, and owing a blood debt to him and her as a result, which I didn't know was going to happen. I felt, like I said last campaign diary, this is Lady Antonia acting, not me. I, I just, this is what she would do is what I thought. Giving them the prince's seals so now they can go anywhere they want in the city and do whatever they want. And they don't have to worry about being allied to any of the great houses. That's crazy. That's as crazy as them taking the squid ship as far as I'm concerned. So they've done some remarkable things in their, in their desperate attempt to weave a path to what they want without having to actually ally themselves with any of the great houses. Well, so my plan is that resolving that ambiguity and giving them an easy answer, uh, they're going to like it and it's probably going to be fun, but I'm not sure that giving them easy answers is what D&D &D is going to be about. So 
So obviously that means that however much they like this person, however happy they are to finally have clear, obvious direction in the campaign, uh, at some point I'm probably going to have to take that away from them. It's not something that's going to last. It's not going to be subterfuge. It is going to be what it seems to be, but that means that uh, it can't last forever and the players are going to have to, the players, there's going to be a point where they're running the show. They're not working for other people. But we're going to get a little while, probably a level or two, where they are working for other people and that'll be a lot of fun for them, I think. So stay tuned for next week where uh, the players meet the Society of the Sapphire Sky. I think they just call themselves the Sapphire Sky and the Knights of the Sapphire Sky, also known as the Knights of the Golden Cross, I think, or the Knights of the Gold Dragon. And yeah, that's going to be that's going to be pretty extraordinary for them and a lot of fun. And plus, I've got this crazy mega dungeon that the players are going to be going through encounter by encounter, which I like. I think that the funny thing is these campaign diaries, I often am worried about the blah, blah, and that the people watching are going to be that, you know, the players, they're not, they're not, they don't have the background that I have in theater and stuff like that. They, many of them have been playing D&D for 30 years. And when you combine those things, it gives me the power to kind of extemporaneously play these different NPCs and it's no big deal. And the, the players are are getting better and better at speaking extemporaneously, speaking in character. Phil's doing a great job as Slim. Matt O'Driscoll's doing an amazing job as Leech. Tom's doing great. Everybody's doing a great job playing their characters. But I'm always worried that the people watching are like, God, they're so awkward and it's taking so long for them to say what they mean. And so I look back at those moments and go, eh, I'm not sure they were very watchable. But then I read the comments and people are like, that was my favorite part. I didn't like the combat stuff because I thought it was tedious and boring, which I completely understand. I do not think watching people play War Board games or board games on Twitch is fun, with exceptions like code names. I actually do think code names is fun for very specific, elaborate reasons that I thought a lot about. It's the reason we stream code names so much. So yeah, watching us go through the process of fighting monsters is I don't think it's going to be that much fun to, to for an audience, but I love it. I it's so much so much of my joy of Dungeons and Dragons is the um, is the dungeon crawling, whether or not that dungeon is a castle or a keep or a, a extra dimensional squid ship, but that feeling of clearing rooms of what's in the next room of what, what is this level about? So there's going to be a lot of that. There's probably gonna be a couple of levels of that. I was sort of, I'm, I'm sort of anticipating Ringwell being what gets them to like, I don't know, 15th level. It won't be continuous Ringwell adventuring. It'll be Ringwell, you know, a lot of downtime stuff and a lot of side quests and stuff. But Ringwell is my mega dungeon and it's a dungeon that I've been working on on and off literally since 1985, although I've never really sprung it on anyone because it's never been, I've only ever used bits and pieces of it because it's never been complete and I felt like this was a good opportunity to quasi make it complete. So we'll see. It's also heavily inspired by lots of stuff I've run and enjoyed. So I don't know if Ringwell's ever going to become a product. If it did become a product, it would probably end up having to be reworked a lot. So it was wholly original as opposed to an amalgam of my original stuff and lots of other nonsense that I've stolen. I'm really looking forward to that and have been ever since we started. Ever since we started this campaign, I knew the players were going to get to Ringwell. And I knew once they get to Ringwell, my life is going to be a lot easier because I have so much of that already developed that I don't have to be constantly inventing everything as the players go. I can only spend a couple of hours in prep before the session and not feel like I did last Wednesday where I had to throw out tons of stuff that I really wanted to do, which we will get to. It's just going to have to be parceled out like slower and at different points just because I wanted to get to the next chunk of content. So that's a huge relief to me. This is the beginning of the end of me having to throw the rails in front of the train as we're going and it may result in a better campaign i don't know a more watchable campaign i have no idea i'm i certainly get a huge kick out of reading the comments to these videos now and also the live we all go back and we watch the comments in the live stream because i think all the folks that didn't that they they, they wanted something else or didn't know what they wanted they're all gone the folks you folks watching this now are really into it and that makes me super happy and i think that what we what's happened is if you watch the chat especially you see that there's been a transition away from audience members into surrogate players it used to be people constantly complaining about how boring the show was to watch because they were audience members i get that but i'm not running for them i'm running for my players and the people who are left are the ones who are kind of trying to play along they talk in chat and they talk in the discord about what they would do and how they would interpret this information and they're obviously using all the, the 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 people in chat knew this was Ringwell way before the players did, right?
right? Because they're invested kind of like surrogate players. And watching that happen has been a lot of fun for me. So I really appreciate all the time you folks spend watching this content. Even if you're just watching the campaign diaries, we spend a lot of time just on the campaign diaries. It's a lot of work, but I think you also see a lot of the behind the scenes stuff. I'm not sure there are, I'm not sure there is another, there might be, I wouldn't know, another DM who is who is who who has the audience that I have and spends uh, so much time talking about his own disappointments and failings. And I see a lot of people, especially on Reddit, saying, wow, it's nice to see that Matt can run a game that engages his players as much as it does and seems to be fun from our point of view and is constantly second guessing himself and doubting himself and disappointed in how things went because it makes them, of course, of course I do. I think all DMs are like that, just not all of them talk about it, right? So that's, that's right? not all of them are obligated to talk about it. I think there's definitely something to be said for running, streaming a game, streaming an entire game and never doing a campaign diary and letting the work speak for itself. I'm a huge fan, like my novels, huge fan of letting the work speak for itself and not going back and trying to justify or explain my decisions. And it would be nice to run a campaign like that someday. But for this campaign, because of the Kickstarter, because of the YouTube channel, I thought definitely let's make sure that you folks all get the straight dope from behind the scenes, including the things that frustrate me and disappoint me and the normal, which is all just normal creative process. It's not me being too hard on myself. We've said this before. I'm not being too hard on myself. I'm merely being critical of the work, which is how we get better. And I think last week was a great example of that. It was a lot of fun. I think the week before was kind of mwah, the perfect example of me learning from my mistakes, which you guys kind of got to see live. We did a video as it happened, the night after it happened of me failing to give the players the right information. And as a result, Bill's character, Skoros, this is in the last campaign, almost kind of two campaigns ago, died in a very undramatic, unsatisfying way that upset the players. And that was a failing on my part. Even though all the comments in that video were like, uh, that wasn't your fault. It was, I'm like, it was totally my fault. I know what I should have done. I could have done it if I were smarter. And I, I had the same situation coming up again. And you got to watch me head it off at the pass. I'm going to talk to the players. I'm not going to like sit them down and tell them what to do. I'm just going to ask one question. And that one question resulted in what you saw last last week and Slim not taking the bait. And that kind of makes me happy to see that if you follow all this content, you can watch me getting better as a dungeon master. The reason I like doing this, the reason I like being a writer, the reason I like being a dungeon master, the reason I like making these videos is because I, I don't think I will ever stop getting better. There are some things, there are lots of them, acting, writing, being a dungeon master, that you can literally devote your entire life to and be constantly getting better and constantly finding ways to improve. And so that's the reason I think this content is going to be evergreen and the reason I enjoy doing it so much. Thank you for coming along this journey with us. I look forward to seeing you folks live tonight, Twitch, uh, 7 p.m. Pacific time. There's a link in the doobly-doo. Until then, peace out. <laughs>